It's so good to be back here. I'm so glad it prevailed. The poets prevailed. <laughs> the bureaucracy. First time I read for this Sit Woodstock Festival, I was replacing um, Jory Graham. <laughs> And everyone showed up thinking Jory Graham was me. It was me. Today I'm replacing, I think I'm replacing Ron Padgett. Uh, old bio in snow. There's always a snowstorm coming and I'm always booked at a cafe on the other side of the mountain. And I'm driving on bald tires to give another lecture on Hegel's vision of the infinite whole, and at the last minute deciding to lecture on wind and snow and their effects on discarded newspapers. No, wait. This one's about repeating the past. There's always a snowstorm coming, and I'm always driving in the dark, and I'm insanely happy, and I'm weaving along the winding cliffs and careening down the other side of the summit in the little blue car, parking, sliding a quarter in a cute meter, meter and bouncing off with my manila folders under my arm and my garbandine overcoat flapping open like a hospital gown to give lectures on vision and snow and repeating the past. And if they introduced me with an old bio, so be it. No need to mention the latest gummy linguistic situation in words or my recent award for laying on the rug and staring at the lacy, vacant spider webs in the petticoats of a glass cupboard. No, forget the laurels. What matters tonight is time and blizzards and saving on your next purchase with a coupon from your unconscious. Now, snow. Snow, that form of water which haunts. It follows you indoors in obedience to air until it feels fire, then it looks for a place to lay down with fire, to then elope with the earth, to move slowly to the sea. I just thought I knew something, and light was pouring through me onto the floor. But everything shifts one moment to the next and leaves a dark stain where it was. I remember something, then panic sets in. A metaphor no longer holds like it used to. I master no single existence in the past, and yet here I am, still with my name and my mutant face. It's not real, they say, the past, that is. Even if an ember is burning holes clean through, cherries drop from the tips of cigarettes fallen many, many years ago, back before they put phones in pockets, and people wrote numbers all over the stairwells, and no one stopped reading a book to take a picture of one of its pages. Ridiculous. Instead, there were long, uninterrupted hours of reading and smoking and crying. Your own eyes wept, as they do now, though looking back, you're not sure who was weeping and who was watching the weeping. Time is also about waiting for an almost imperceptible change in a single tear. Mother's textured silence. Disturbed neighborhood kids coming together in the woods to echo their own households. It's never really about the why in crying, is it? I mean, in terms of narrative, it just comes, resembling meaning, like an old bio resembling snow and holding in your mind the object of a spruce tree at whose base a kitten is buried, wrapped in a tea towel. And everywhere there is a white soil coming, carried sideways by wind and down by gravity, a pale inflection on its many cold lips. And it doesn't need to know where it came from, to know it is part of the whole, and it is snow, and it falls on your face and ends. I know, I know it's raining, it's summer. Theory. There is no theory vengeful enough for this life. 
You must just keep living it. The greatest revenge is the unprovable work, employed barefoot in the grass, aimless. But there are times I want to find the right concept, not psalm, but a legitimized science of the psyche. Does it unfold me is always the question. To be beside it, a tentative pleasure in pleasing the academy. I love to hover in the indexes, the footnotes, the vibrant arguments of members of the faculty thrill me. But my greatest fear, to be condemned to theory, without song, without my trash, my mad octavo rima, my pointless point. Without that, I'm nothing. The academic is there to formalize the indifference of the poetic towards the academic. In the night, only the mad wind means turning the electricity off in one mighty blow so that when you wake, all the clocks are wrong. And the wind chimes, where once I heard a secret revealed in their music, are splayed in silence, a dead language waiting to be rehung in the maple. What's poetry like? A good question. So there's got to be a simile, right? What's poetry like? can't say what it is. If we say what it is, we'll cease to be. <laughs> when knowing stops, I think the world stops. When knowing is known, it's over. Poets play the winter tarantella, making love in the midnight hours on a white iron bed like a dog skeleton. Distinguishing the essential and unessential moment shared between ordinary lunatics, screaming over a bird in an apple tree until an elegy has to be written to resuscitate the relation. Those who look toward the depleted wildlife of neighborhoods with tragic relish, to see somehow ourselves disappearing about ourselves. Once in New York City years ago, the internet technician finally arrived. His teenage apprentice stood in my living room over a trans trauma book. He said it looked kind of cool, and he wanted to know what it was. Poetry, I said. What's poetry like, he asked. And the treacherous inadequacy with which one finds oneself explaining in a few loose, deficient words something with lungs and no face. The immortal freak of language you haunt and hunt, which is the original state of language you're trying to get back to from within. Poetry, whose rare geniuses come as bittersweet suicidal explosions on the tongue, randomly felt during a long, tedious meal, award-winning and already forgotten. All the emoting of unanalyzable fragments, all the surrender and detonations of precision and reckless insight and references to hidden wisdom and coke cans, conversations across time and slips into truth and obscurity of thought altogether blissful, the form itself at its best, strings of dreams in the waking life, overlaid like unobserved clothing, the words that sing stillness, the silence craved, by perpetual auctioneers. That which is not the tale of event, but itself an event. You know what? Just take the book, I said, finally, <laughs> pushing it into his hands. Thanks, he said, and took it away, grinning a little. But later, with snow in my head and the thunder in my right eyelid, I was worried, as I was so dangerously then about dark yet unspoken things. It frightened me. That shiny black and white book wafting around New York City in the back of a Time Warner cable van, <laughs> waiting to be opened, waiting to torment him, thinking of it changing his life.
Unfortunately, unfortunately, we looked at 3,000 rare and troubled poets bolted in rooms and terrified with words, and you were not among those chosen to be paid for it. Today, you will do it for free, happily, sublimated in your attic with books and a dog on a pillow, and you will do it for nothing today and tomorrow and the next day as the daffodil works in the cold rain of April not knowing it was once longed for by a god. So, um, this poem's called Memory Palace, and um, a memory palace is kind of like, I mean, I haven't looked that far into it, but it's, I think we kind of know all what it is. It's like people, it's like a trick to remember things. Um, you like build a, you build a real place in your mind. <laughs> you build a you build a real 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 place that's unseen in your mind. Now you don't you don't really need to know that or even understand it to uh, to uh, hear this poem. But but there it is, memory palace. Oof. Every memory, every, I'm, I'm deleting my poetry banter in my memory palace. Every memory palace should have a wet basement with cracked pipes and mouse bones between the foundation and every memory palace should have my childhood basement at the dead end of Elm Street with its decaying beams and dirt floor where we stored a mannequin named Greta who scared us shitless every time we went to reset the hot water tank. Greta, purchased from Pockett's department store closing sale in 1999. The same store my feet were measured by those amazing people who used to be in the world who knelt down in front of you like Magdalene and her wet hair on the hooves of Christ to press your big toe through the leather and tell you to walk around a little, see how it feels. <laughs> Everything back then was khaki and ketchup red and frosted glass and pastel floral. And Santa Claus lived there at the top of the stairs and I sat on him, suddenly aware of how grubby my winter coat was and my nails and how crooked my gaze, and Greta watched, flawless in her prime from her corner, in the newest pencil, skirt, and pantyhose, and sweater, not knowing that later she would be purchased by us for 40 bucks, <laughs> not knowing she would end up on the floor, naked, dismembered, her boobs bared for no one but the spiders and the plumbers, her arm lying beside her and her hand with three missing fingers that were kicking around somewhere upstairs, I have no memory palace. I have tomato paste cans bloating on a ply plywood sagging shelf. Memory, memory, my botulism exhibit. My lockjaw, my declawed cat. Come, and you'll trip over a cement statue of a cement bag that got wet before it was even opened. All its creases preserved perfectly. When I look back, there's an axe in my head and a tarp laid over me. There's a white mask hanging on the wall with no eyes, just holes with more wall looking out. So angry, so angry it's frozen in a red smile, guarding what can neither see nor hear, let alone remember, let alone make a palace. Um, the mask. Uh, the, the mask. Hi. 
I feel like I'm alone up here a little bit. Um, and then I'm like, oh, we're all here together. It's so nice to be like alone and, and together. That's the poem all over it. The fantasies are tangled up with the old objective suffering. I'm tired, just let me sleep. You can't reverse engineer it all, only keep living. The anger wears you until you're blown apart by the slightest breeze. I've worked so hard, self. So. Now let me sleep. The archetypal defenses with the hidden idea my body is leathered with them. I've been rooting like a truffle pig in the black soil and the scent on the wind is delicious and rare. Let me go, Rapunzel. You who can barely lift your 20-foot braids, but there she goes again letting down her hair for the witch to crawl back up, to kiss the girl on the lips, to make dark red marks across her sealed mouth. When will it end? Well, there's not much to be done in terms of thinking it through. It'll start thinking you. Memory is tricky, an issue of the translator. Memory, rolled in desire like raw meat and breadcrumbs and yolk and sizzled for ages. It usually gets worse, much worse, burned beyond recognition in front of everyone. You have to spend as long as it takes to bear a single word beside another word. You have to find some current event in your gaze and you have to look up at the eternal stranger there in intimacy. You have to see the top and you have to see the bottom, and you have to see the navel of the dream. And he'll stand and approach at a distance, and you have to love him, and you have to make him cry at least once. Your little drama flayed on the cross in front of him. You have to play it out, and then spend hours alone in its aftermath, looking out the window, watching the sky change in one day, watching the hawks circle, so high they're like barrettes, matter caught in the blowing gray hair of the inaudible, the unseen, the barely restrained, the spinning world. So the last poem I'm gonna read is, I mean, I've been killing myself over this little poem. I mean, it was like three pages, a year ago, and then it was three different poems, and it was one poem, and then I was asked to like contribute a poem to this like Taylor Swift anthology of like poems in response to her tortured poem poets department album that I haven't even listened to, but I was like, this poem has tortured me for a long time. Um, um, I set myself up because I thought I could write about love. You know, that's a poem that never is finished. It's called Love's Cure. And um, thank you so much. Of love, I am slowly becoming more aware. When love manifests from exactly where it has always been, it fills in my head like a weird gold crayon. Lucretus knew love to be suspect. Given a potion for it, it nearly killed him, and in rare moments of lucidity for his remaining life, he railed against love, working endlessly on his six-volume didactic poem on Epicurean physics, the nature of existence, and the condition of making the lover into a godlike power before he committed suicide. And for this, we consider love's therapy. Love comes like a wave. It hits the ground and disappears. One shivers then. Love makes you more susceptible to wind. Of the erotic, forget what you know, for love leaps along it, the unremembered part of the dream. I stood long in my office with the sun in my head, alone with another thought rising. Outside, the dark between the leaves looked back at me. I wanted you as lover. 
the great phenomenological drama between desire and what is memory, a kind of belief among the tortured, fell and pulled in a current of light and changed course. Love, to watch a beautiful, separate world within us die and live and die and live. Thank you all so much.